from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming up today, K-State's Glenn Tonzer with this week's cattle market segment. He'll comment on the sharp downturn in the cattle markets last week, stressing that the shutdown of the Tyson packing plant in southwest Kansas was only partially responsible for that market bearishness. Also today, K-State's Joe Jansen shares his analysis of the USDA's latest round of market facilitation program payments, attempting to explain the variations in those MFP payment rates from county to county. Also this week's 4-H segment, Jeff Wickman talks with K-State's Alaya Mestrovich C. about a 4-H communications skills boot camp held earlier this month. All that and more here on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. This is the K-State Radio Network, and it's good to have you aboard once again for Agriculture Today. The cattle market scene, first of all, with Glenn Tonzer, our guest, livestock economist, K-State Research and Extension. A number of things we'll pick up on this week, Glenn, but it was just a lousy week for the commodity markets in total, and the cattle market surely was not spared of that. No, it wasn't. And, uh, you know, last week, Daryl Peel was on here to comment on the immediate aftermath of the Holcomb plant uh, developments. Mm -hmm. The developments this week, obviously, are largely tied to that, and I don't want to dismiss that, but I am going to try to highlight it's not the only thing at play. Uh, There's a lot of uncertainty in the commodity markets, as you said, that was there. So before we get off and kind of the explaining why things happen, let's just break down the actual numbers for Mm -hmm. the week. So when you look at cash trade, Fed cattle, five market was below 106 this past week. That was down about six bucks. Um, When you break that down by state, here in Kansas, 105 was down almost five dollars full. Uh, Nebraska was down actually a little bit more than five bucks. Texas down right about five bucks as well. So across the five market region, we had a notable pullback in the cash market. When you look at live cattle on the board, uh, the August contract closed below 100, so 99.80 uh, to be specific. That was down a full eight bucks uh, on the week. Flip over to feeder cattle, sticking with the board briefly. The September contract closed at 132 and change, down about six dollars for the week. Cash, uh, AMS called it 5 to $10 down. When I look at different markets, at least here in the Kansas, Oklahoma region, I'd say it was every bit of 10 down in most weight classes. That's primarily because feed yard interest sort of dried up, particularly early in the week, so it's not surprising. Two specific lots I noted here in Kansas, six to six and a half weight lots traded for 152.61 cents, and then a heavier head, 850 to 900 pound lot, large group, 876 head, traded at 128 and a half. All these are painful numbers. They are way down, and I'll, I'll try to explain kind of why I think it happened mm-hmm. in a moment. But you can't complete the story unless you also talk about meat prices. Right. So choice cutout was actually up 22 bucks for the week, so 238. 69 cents. Select cutout was up just under 20 bucks for the week, uh, 213 and change. Tuesday and Wednesday in particular were the largest daily changes that we've had on the cutout, largest increases on record since 2000 when mandatory price reporting data uh, began. So the way I've been describing this is when you have a major event like we had in Holcomb is the processing capacity in the industry was shrunk. The ability to handle cattle compared to the day before that event was reduced, and that's going to increase the cost of operating and processing cattle. What does that do towards cattle prices? That, in econ jargon, is it decreases the derived demand for fed cattle, and that's how you see the pushback on fed cattle prices and subsequently feeder cattle prices. That in itself wasn't surprising. I think many analysts would have seen something similar to what occurred this week there. What I think was a little more surprising when you look back on the week was the magnitude of the cutout price increase. The cutout was up about 9% for the week, and the cattle prices declined about 5%, depending on exactly which weight class we look at. So the fact that the cutout rallied much more than cattle were depressed wasn't really being predicted by many folks, myself included. Uh, I was discussing why it would go up, but I didn't anticipate that much up. 
first and foremost, there's some indirect evidence that buyers of beef, so those that were buying from packers and processors in this case, may not have had lots of stocks lined up. So they were a little bit shorthanded and concerned that now the ability to produce beef took a hit to the extent there was beef on the ground that had impact, you know, it was impact in the event itself. That was a reduction in supplies. And in aggregate, USDA puts out the cold storage report that I talk about fairly often when we're Mm -hmm. on here. And the most recent was for July. So July beef cold storage numbers were below 400 million pounds. And I'm noting that because that is the lowest we've had since October of 2014. And we've added notable number of animals and therefore beef pounds to the production system since October of 2014. So if you do that on any kind of, you know, relative measure to what we're producing, the stocks number was fairly low. So if you have a low amount of beef in the cold storage system and then you have a production hit like we had, it's not surprising that you have an upward run in cutout prices. Now, the fact that that was higher than the depression on cattle prices wasn't expected. That's why I'm going through this. The good news in that is that run-up in cutout prices would not occur to that magnitude unless there was a desire for those pounds and demand was pretty good going the other way, at least in the eyes of market traders or they're concerned about not having product to move and so forth. So potentially there's still some good characteristics about demand in the marketplace that might help us, I don't know if I'm going to use the term reverse, but at least stabilize the cattle prices and maybe eventually pull us back up. But to the duration of the impact of the Tyson plant being incapacitated by that fire and offline for quite a time, still a bit of uncertainty about that? There is. So we're now 10 days after the event itself. And, of course, there's lots of media discussion on this. And the only thing that I've seen both officially and unofficially on the topic is it will be months, not weeks, is the phrase that's floating around the media. And all that alludes to is it's not going to be a easy rebuild. The fact it's not years is good, and there's still a commitment in the public by Tyson to rebuild. Anecdotally, the gross margin for a packer this past week improved notably. So fed cattle prices declined, cutout prices went up. That is going to give an incentive for all parties that are able to help absorb in the short term, but it's also going to give an incentive to rerun that plant, most likely, unless something drastically changes. So that gives me some optimism that it, w- in fact, will be rebuilt and put back to work here in Kansas. For our Kansas listeners, that's a really good thing if that develops. But months, not weeks, is what has come out since uh, Dr. Peel was on this segment a week ago. And you do note as well that we can't lose sight of overall federally inspected slaughter levels, and that those are no small part of this scenario. Yeah. And and before I even break those down, my point here is there's a lot of moving parts, not just one event, right? Right. And that's one of them. So uh, federal inspected cattle slaughter came in at 651,000 for the week, and that was up 9,000 head compared to the week before. And even that got lots of controversial discussion because how can that be up after we have a big, you know, loss in capacities where that comes from? And that in itself takes some time to absorb. So if you look at the last 20 years of that number, we get that number every week, and you see what in August, same week every year, typically occurs, two-thirds of the time that week we actually have an increase compared to the week before. And that's mainly for seasonal reasons as we have cattle coming in that need to be processed. That's not new. I'm reminding us of that. On average over those 20 years, and I'm not counting 2019, I'm stopping with 2018, is we had 5,500 more head processed in that week in August than the week before in August. And in fact, we actually had one year where the number went up by 30,000. Why am I sharing all that? I think if you did not have the Holcomb fire, we would have had a notable increase and more than a 9,000 head increase in processing this particular week. But that actually mitigated our ability to be more than nine. So we were on track for an uptake, but it still ended up being positive and not a negative. And it's because this time of year, we often up the amount we process. Almost hate to ask this, but you do update the feedlot cattle returns regularly. And we've been talking about this every time you stop over and Well, not good. Yeah, so for multiple months, I've been projecting notable losses for closeouts here for the rest of 2019. And I did update these on uh, August 15th, so it reflects a good number of the uh, downward price pressures we've been talking about in Cattle Complex. And that part of the story is only magnified. So losses are being projected for over $100 and in a couple of cases over $250 per head. Referring to steers, heifers aren't quite as extreme in a few months. But the core reason for that is we're projecting fed cattle prices at 110 or lower 
we have purchase feeder cattle prices in the upper 130s to the mid 140s, and the cost of gain is 85 to low 90s. I've given us those numbers because some of our listeners are going to have different experience there. If their cost of gain or lower won't be quite as extreme, but the developments over the last few weeks in particular have been damaging to feedlot returns. Lower projected fed cattle prices, and we haven't necessarily had a massive improvement in the feed grain complex. There's still notable uncertainty there as well. For our listeners that aren't as familiar, every month I update these. They're on our agmanager.info website. You're welcome to encourage to go there. It's a barometer of profitability trends if you're not hedged is the point of that. But events like this week are definitely damaging to projected returns for Kansas feed yards. And also on Ag Manager, to note, you have the latest on beef demand, the monthly update, both domestically and in the export channels. Yes. So there's a delay in the data availability there. So the numbers I have available are for the month of June. And the punchline here would be is for June, all three major meets, domestic demand decline was down. So demand weakened in June compared to May. And unfortunately, the same statement holds on the export front. So I also have separate indices now that are specific to U.S. exports of beef, pork, and chicken. And chicken demand in particular declined on the foreign market in June. And beef and pork had a slight pullback as well. So going forward, we're going to have to, if you like, mesh out what those June particular negative numbers were with what I tried to describe earlier was in July, we had a favorable cold storage situation. Going forward, one of those two will change because one's very positive and one's negative on the demand front. And it's always important to understand the demand situation, but it's even more so when we have the uncertainty of processing capacity, how long it's going to have a hit, feed grain uncertainty, which we've alluded to, and what I don't think I've taken the time to say, but this past week was one of the most turbulent ones in the stock market as well. So there's notable, let's call it macroeconomic uncertainty at play as well. More countries have negative interest rates than we had a month ago. That bears some bearish tone on beef demand as well. So there's a lot of moving parts, and it's not just the whole complaint is what I'm trying to impress on folks here. You will not be short of talking points as you address the cattle market outlook at the Risk and Profit Conference coming up this Friday. No, I will not. So I'm slated to be, uh, I believe it's right after lunch on Friday, try to hopefully keep it light and talk on these topics. But on a serious note, anybody that has interest, I do encourage you to come and I will do my best to answer your questions at that event. By the way, today is the final day for registering for that Risk and Profit Conference at agmanager.info. And we're looking forward to seeing you there and hearing what you have to say, Glenn. Thanks for coming over. Thanks for having me on, Eric. This week's cattle market segment featuring livestock economist Glenn Tonzer, K-State Research and Extension. We'll return with more on agriculture today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. We're back now on this Agriculture Today, taking up now a topic that's been out there for the last few weeks, ever since the USDA announced a second round of what commonly is called Trade A, more formally Market Facilitation Program payments, this round two, and these were constructed in a way different from the first round of payments, and that has brought up some questions which were addressed in a recent analysis by our guest. He's Joe Jansen, agricultural economist at Kansas State University. Getting at here, Joe, the fact that these MFP payments round two were based on something other than the criteria that were used for MFP1, and you might remind us of all of that before we talk about your analysis proper. Right. So in the summer of 2018, the USDA announced the first market facilitation program, and they announced that there would be payments made on actual production of specific crops and paid at a specific rate. So there was a rate for every crop that got a payment under the program. And so the big headline numbers were soybeans are going to get paid $1.65 a bushel under this program, and wheat was going to get 14 cents a bushel, and corn was going to get one cent a bushel. And 
you could argue as sort of like you know the, the magnitude of those numbers and whether the, the relative you know magnitudes were fair, uh, but that was the way that program was was done was on a per bushel basis. And basically, what the USDA did was estimate sort of the effect of the trade conflict on each of those crops and say, okay, we'll allocate that across all of U.S. production. So. For all of the 14 billion bushels of corn, we're going to take whatever we think the damage from the trade conflict is and divide that by 14 billion, and we get a number. And that's that was one cent a bushel. Mm-hmm. For MFP2, the existence of a second round of MFP payments was announced sooner in the crop year. So announced this spring when planting was still going on. And the concern was we don't want to, these payments to affect – you know, the incentives that farmers face from the market in terms of which crops they should plant. So it was decided that those payments would be made on a per acre basis. So that there would be one rate, uh, a payment rate for every county, and that payment would be paid on all acres of eligible crops. And so the payment rates were announced at the end of July, and the payments ranged dramatically across counties. So there are some counties in the United States getting a $15 an acre payment, and there are some counties in the United States getting a $150 an acre payment, 10 times as much on a per acre basis. Which prompted the question, how were those county rates determined? What constituted those? If you're a farmer and you see that your neighbor across the county line is getting $50 an acre payment when you're getting a $40 an acre payment, you might say, well, how did those payment rates get calculated? And to be quite frank, the USDA was not totally transparent in how those rates were determined. And it was difficult to say, well, is MFP2 more generous or favor some crops relative to others because you can't compare a per acre payment to a per bushel payment. Mm -hmm. So what we did was to say, well, you know, could we try and figure out how those county rates translated back into a per bushel payment rate? Assuming that the USDA said, okay, here's the effect of the damage from the trade war. And let's allocate that damage to crops. And then in specific counties, counties that have sort of more corn would get a payment based on that corn rate. And counties that have more soybeans would get a payment based more on soybeans and cotton and wheat and so on and so on. So we tried to take those county rates and translate them back to a a per bushel or a per pound rate, depending on the crop. Sort of a reverse analysis, if you will. Yeah, essentially we tried to reverse engineer the formula that that would give you the set of county-level payment rates that we see. Mm -hmm. So without getting too deeply into the economic mechanics of this, how did you go about that? So we we took the data and we said, okay, well, if, you know, these counties grew these crops and have these yields, so this county, you know, half of their acres are in corn and their average corn yield is 160 bushels an acre, then... What's the rate that would get you the county rate? So sort of kind of fill in the blank. What's that county rate, that commodity specific rate for corn that would get you the county rate that the USDA actually posted? And so we can essentially solve for what's the implied commodity specific MFP2 payment rate. And we can compare those to the MFP1 payment rates. And that's, uh, that's sort of the takeaway. That's the, if, if you go on our Ag Manager website, you can find the analysis. And there's a pretty nice summary table that shows what's the MFP1 rate and then what's the MFP2 rate that we calculate. And we found that the MFP2, the commodity specific payment rates that we calculated, fit the data really well. So I feel like fairly confident that this is at least approaching what USD actually did. Now, our data is incomplete. We don't have full county production data for every county in the United States. The USDA, the National Ag Statistics Service, doesn't report data for every crop in every county and all across the United States. But there's enough data there that we feel like we've, we fit the data pretty closely. And we can say something about sort of comparing the two programs. And let's do that. How do they match up? And is one, to put it this way, more lucrative than the other? Generally speaking, MFP2 is more more generous than MFP1. And if you sort of look at the top line numbers, I think the USDA said they've paid out about 9 to $10 billion in MFP1 payments. And they said that the MFP2 program would be about $14 billion. So you'd expect, okay, if there's more money in the overall pot, then the program should be more generous. And so for most crops, the payment rates that we estimate, uh, crop-specific payment rates, are bigger than they were under MFP1. But some crops grow a lot more than others. So the soybean payment rate that we estimate is pretty similar to that $1.65 a bushel that we saw last time under MFP1. But for corn, I estimate that MFP2 payment rate is about 23 cents per bushel. As opposed to a penny. As opposed to a penny the first time around. So significantly more generous. 
Other crops that sort of increase a lot, cotton and wheat payments grow by about three times what they were under MFP1. And then some crops get payments where they maybe didn't get payments before. So, for example, rice and peanuts, two crops that I fully understand are not that important to Kansas farmers, um, but are part of the, the calculus of this program. I estimate that they get payments the part of the the county payments was based on a payment to peanuts or and to rice, and that wasn't the case before. The other way to sort of look at the at the payment rates is to think about well, how big are these commodity specific payment rates relative to price? So, as a percentage of the price, how big are the the, the program payments? And you see that the program. Sp- specifically favors probably three crops more than others, and that's soybeans, sorghum, and cotton. And those crops have been you know, significantly affected by, by the trade conflict. And so we estimate, for example, that the sorghum payment is about $1.50 a bushel, the implied sorghum payment. Mm-hmm. If you sort of take those numbers and you look at sort of the map of county level payment rates, we think it does a pretty good job of explaining why there are some counties in southwestern Kansas that gets significantly larger payments under this program than other counties in, in the state. So those counties are counties that grow significant amounts of corn and irrigated corn that has relatively high yields. So the two real things that are driving MFP2 payment rates, that are driving the county level rates specifically, I should say, are counties that have relatively high yields of crops that are relatively favored under the program. So if your county grows a significant amount of corn and you have relatively good yields, you're going to see much bigger payments under this program than you did under MFP1. Mm -hmm. Counties that are more soybean dependent are going to see sort of something similar to what they saw under MFP1. The the payment rate, when you sort of compare what you got in 2018 versus what you got in 2019, might be relatively similar if you're in a soybean dependent county or a county that's sort of more heavily weighted towards soybeans. But again, you've gone through this rather arduous exercise, and what you're hoping folks will do is have a look at it and uh, just think about how it might well be an explanation for those MFP payment rates and how they were put together, because the numbers, like you say, seem to line up pretty well. Right. I think the takeaway message here is that there is a process by which the USDA determined these. Because they did not publish that process explicitly, a lot of questions were asked, and this is one attempt, I think a, a pretty reasonable attempt at sort of getting at what was that underlying process and what's the set of sort of payments to specific commodities that led to the county level payment rates that we observe. And we would invite folks to have a look directly at your article that covers the entire work here that you've done. It's entitled Explaining Variation Across Counties in 2019 Market Facilitation Program Payment Rates. It is, of course, up now on the agmanager.info website. I'll also mention that we will be uh, I'll be presenting some of this work that I've done on sort of understanding the effect of the trade conflict on agriculture and how the USDA is developing an uh, aid to respond to that trade conflict uh, at this week's Risk and Profit Conference, uh, which is here in Manhattan on the 22nd and 23rd. It's this coming Thursday and Friday, so be sure to take that in. That's one of the breakout sessions at Risk and Profit. And again, agmanager.info, you've still time to squeeze in your registration for that. But today (laughs) is the day to get that done. We appreciate the time and the insight that you've put together here, Joe. Thanks for coming by. Thank you, Eric. Joe Jansen, agricultural economist at K-State, he made more than a valiant effort at coming up with an economic explanation for the payment rates that were determined on a county level for those market facilitation program payments that are being applied for currently at local FSA offices around Kansas and the nation. There is a great lot of other material, again, that will be fully covered at that Risk and Profit Conference, stressing this once more because today is the registration deadline. So you might want to jump right on that before the day is out. Again, agmanager.info is the place to take care of that business. And you're listening to Agriculture Today. Now we'll stand aside for a few moments when we come back to today's agricultural news headlines, along with this week's edition of Tree Tales from the Kansas Forest Service at K-State and our weekly 4-H segment for you likewise. Please keep it right here on the K-State Radio Network. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global Food Systems is one of the five grand challenges K 
K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and moving ahead now with today's agricultural news headlines for you. These courtesy in part of DTN. According to a report from Reuters, President Donald Trump phoned EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler last week and told him to go ahead and announce the small refiner exemptions for the 2018 compliance year. As far as the renewable fuel standard, the news service said that the president told Wheeler he had had enough of the situation and gave Wheeler the green light to announce the EPA was granting 31 small refiner exemptions for that 2018. 18 compliance year. Now, National Corn Growers Association Chief Executive Officer John Doggett told DTN that his group will continue to tell the White House how waivers hurt family farmers and ethanol producers. Quoting Doggett here, it was a surprise and not a good surprise. He went on to say, in his words, we have gotten the president's attention about how important the continued issuance of these waivers and this continued demand destruction we have in the corn industry, whether it's trade or ethanol. This was a body blow, not a glancing blow, but this was a body blow in Doggett's words. Deer and Company says lower demand for U.S. farm commodities is discouraging farmers from buying its machinery. Deer, which reported lower sales for the third quarter, trimmed its sales forecast for the year. Deer said it expects equipment sales in Brazil to strengthen in the coming months as farmers there respond to higher demand for commodities from China to replace U.S. exports. Deer's quarterly sales of tractors, harvesting, and other farm equipment fell 6% from a year earlier as profit from the farm equipment business dropped by 24 percent, the company said on Friday. Besides trade uncertainty, Deer said that rainy weather that delayed the spring planting and weakening equipment sales in Canada also contributed to falling equipment sales in the quarter. And that outbreak of African swine fever in China that decimated hog herds and reduced feed demand uh, did affect sales of the company as well. Still, Deer expects about $3.2 billion in profit and a 4% increase in equipment sales overall this year. That would include its construction equipment line. Still down from previous estimates for $3.3 billion in profit and a 5% rise in equipment sales in 2019. The company cut production of farm equipment this spring to lower inventories at its dealerships. Deer said on Friday it would initiate additional cost reductions to improve improve the efficiency of its operations. The company said the factory production of high horsepower models of tractors would be about 5% below retail sales volumes for the rest of this year. And farmland values in the Chicago Fed District fell 1% from year-ago levels during the second quarter of the year, that according to the latest update from that bank. But the survey of 157 bankers in the district that covers parts of Illinois, Indiana, southern Wisconsin, Michigan, and the entire state of Iowa did, however, report values for good agricultural land holding steady with the first quarter. The region experienced excessive rainfall, historic flooding, and widespread planting delays this spring, as you know. Not surprisingly, bankers indicated that 69% of their borrowers were at least modestly affected by the extreme weather for the first half of the year. Nevertheless, the 83% of respondents expect ag land values to hold steady during the third quarter. However, the bank reported that there were major or severe repayment issues with 6% of the district's agricultural loan portfolio. That's a level not seen since the second quarter of 19. 99. 
want to remind you that the third and final event in that series of Kansas Livestock Association K-State Ranch Management Field Days is coming up later this week, this Thursday, as a matter of fact, the 22nd of August. Location this time is just outside of Dorrance in Russell County. It'll be hosted by Rusty Acres, Lyman and Rosemary Nuss managing that operation, a fourth-generation farming and commercial cow-calf operation in Russell County. On the program from the Kansas Department of Agriculture, Emily Voris on how cattle producers can get involved in the security beef supply plan. Cassie Kniebel with the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State with an update on cattle trace. K-State's Keith Harmony on controlling locust trees and yucca plants and K-State's Walt Fick on dealing with old world blue stem. Again, that's the K-State KLA Ranch Management Field Day this Thursday, August the 22nd. It'll take place at Rusty Acres outside of Dorrance. For more information, go to KLA.org. That's KLA.org. Now this week's edition of Tree Tales with K-State Forester Ryan Armbrust. Ryan? Perhaps no native plant in Kansas is as despised as poison ivy, but identification and control of this irritating plant is sometimes not so simple. We have probably all heard the saying, leaves of three, let it be, but there are several other woody plants and vines we may encounter that have three leaflets, such as box elder seedlings, some ornamental vines like clematis, Boston ivy, hyacinth bean, and others. In addition, sometimes our other native vines, such as Virginia creeper or woodbine, get confused for poison ivy, although it has five leaflets instead of three. For those that are sensitive to urushiol, the oily irritant found on poison ivy leaves and stems, it may be wise to give all these lookalikes a wide berth, but care should be taken in deciding on how best to control poison ivy in the landscape. For obvious reasons, pulling poison ivy seedlings with bare hands may not be wise, but even pulling small plants with gloves on may not be the best plan. Only small seedlings can be pulled without regrowth, as larger plants will come back from roots quickly. Because mowing could cause urushiol laden debris to be thrown around, it should be done with care. For larger infestations of poison ivy, herbicides should be considered, but should be used with care. Common active ingredients and products labeled for poison ivy control include glyphosate, triclopyr, dicamba, and 2,4-D. As always, care should be taken to read, understand, and follow label directions, but additional care should be taken when using these herbicides around desirable trees, shrubs, and other vegetation, as injury could easily occur when attempting to treat poison ivy that's growing amongst or near these desirable plants. Finally, if woody stems of poison ivy attach themselves to the bark of trees intended on being used for firewood, Take care to remove as much as possible, since smoke laden with the urushiol from poison ivy has been known to cause serious respiratory irritation, even from burning brush piles. While we might not have to tolerate poison ivy growing in our landscapes that we use on a regular basis, like our backyards, parks, and trails, it's worth remembering that this vine is a native plant, and humans are the only animals that are allergic to it. So there's no great need to spray the ivy deep in your woods, where it may benefit deer and birds. This is Ryan Armbrust, Forest Health Specialist with the Kansas Forest Service, and this has been another Tree Tale. Thanks, Ryan, and this is Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. A day camp at the Rock Springs 4-H Center earlier this month helped youth and agents with a Purple Power Pack, which includes Dickinson, Geary, Pottawatomie, Riley, and Wabunsee counties, improve their conversation and communication skills. Kansas 4-H Culture and Communication Skills Specialist Alaya Mestrovich C. says that the camp interspersed camping activities with those conversation and communication skills. Youth in 4-H learn a lot of different communication skills regardless of the project areas they are in. In a community club, they're going to learn how to get up 
public speak, share their opinion in front of the group. They're going to learn parliamentary procedure. And they're also going to be able to give a project talk, among many other things. What we're trying to do right now is build upon those communication learnings in the culture and communication content area. And we are uh, going to be rolling out a series of workshops for youth that involve communication and cultural skills. So for this day, for example, we had three parts to the day. The first part was learning basic communication skills that involve active listening and understanding communication style differences, as well as being able to show empathy. I think we live in really polarizing times, and it it can be hard at times for us, even as adults, to speak civilly and understand another person's point of view. These youth did an amazing job learning those fundamental communication skills that will make them successful now and in the future in anything they do as they're learning life skills. The second part of the day involved tough conversations. What do I do as a youth when I am under verbal attack from another person? And what is my conflict style? How do I respond in a conflict? Do I shut down? Do I become more engaged in the conflict? How does that work? And in reality, how do I listen to be able to respond and de-escalate a situation? Finally, the last part of the day involved an introduction to civic discourse and democracy. And this is going to actually help prepare youth for our spring event, Citizenship in Action. So youth were able to vote on national issues forums and came up with a couple different national issues that they are going to deliberate on and facilitate community conversations this fall. And go ahead and talk about what they decided. They decided among all of the national issues forums that there were two that were closest to their heart. One was, what do we do about the opioid epidemic in the United States? And how do we prevent mass shootings? So what we're going to do is train youth to be facilitators of this civic discourse. And we will all get together on campus this fall to be able to deliberate and come up with some ideas about how we could move forward on these issues, keeping in mind the common good, which is a leadership concept. And as part of that, you're working with a couple of groups on campus. Yes, we are. So we have partnered with the Center for Engagement and Community Development. We have partnered with ICDD, the Institute for Civic Discourse and Democracy. And we have also partnered with Leadership Studies and Health and Human Services. This is really part of this idea of the project pathway, that there are many different types of experiences that youth can have to deepen their cultural and communication skill development. And it's very much about identity, learning about who am I when I am in a conversation or communicating with someone else, and who are they? How do I perceive them? And then how do we come together and have a conversation and be successful at it? (laughs) You mentioned that it really starts with the active listening. What were some of the things that you went over as part of that? Because really, that's kind of going to lay the foundation for moving forward. Yes. So we had youth think about why we listen. And we really broke it up into three parts, that we listen to gain information, to give affirmation, or to respond to inflammation. So youth got up and actually did role plays and learned about these three different ways to actively listen, to listen for content, to listen for feeling and reflect that, or to listen to de-escalate. And they were amazing at it. I was really impressed. These are skills that are going to help them not only in 4-H, but in what we like to call the real world, because there's a lot of conflict there as well. Yes, I feel like we need to prepare our young people to not be afraid to be in a conflict. And also, that being said, to not be afraid of thought diversity, that really leadership is about really getting all points of view as we move forward together and as we process the societal issues that are currently plaguing our world We are building the future leaders of tomorrow, and we need to equip them with skills that will allow them to be ready. Learning how to really have what some might consider almost a debate, but we're calling it a conversation. And really, that's kind of what it boils down to, isn't it, is just being able to communicate with another person. Yes, and it it is really differentiated from a debate because in this case, It's not really about right or wrong or proving our point. It's more about connecting to the 
emotional experience, the lived experience of someone else, and validating that. Because even if we have to be problem solvers, you know, at camp, these camp counselors are amazing problem solvers. They can actually reach a better um, level of connection with the youth that they're serving if they attend to their feelings first and then problem solve. And so that's something we really broke down, that problem solving is okay, but it's also really good to understand where those campers are coming from. Are they homesick? <laughs> you know, are they tired? Are they cranky? Or, you know, what, what are their emotional needs, too? Will this expand beyond this group to a statewide format? Well, um, we are definitely moving in that direction and taking some steps towards making this available statewide. The next step is having the youth that learned these different fundamental communication skills and an introduction to civic discourse to actually be able to lead community conversations in the fall. So the goal is to invite and open this up to youth that may be interested, but the youth from the P3 Camp Counselor Academy have the opportunity to be in a leadership role and be trained to be civic discourse facilitators before that event actually occurs. And we're really hoping that this becomes a year-long experience where we're looking at all these different ways that youth can deepen their communication and cultural skill development, whether it's citizenship in action, citizenship Washington Focus, the Kansas Youth Leadership Forum, these community conversations. We really are looking at a a year-round experience to further develop the, the project pathways of leadership, communication, and civic engagement. That's Kansas 4-H Culture and Communication Skills Specialist, Alaya Mestrovich C. To learn more about Kansas 4-H, visit kansas4h.org. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.